Welcome to a special edition of Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. Today, Andrew is teaching on who God is and who we are, recorded live from the 2019 Grace and Faith Conference in Telford, England. You need to recognize that you were an absolute mess before Jesus saved you. Apart from God's influence in your life, you just don't realize how perfect God created us to be. And now, here's Andrew. This week on our Gospel Truth broadcast, we are going to be doing something a little different. I'm going to be playing a live teaching that I did in Telford, England back at the end of May. And I was teaching about the true nature of God. I was doing it from a little bit different perspective, just talking about how that to have a relationship with God, you have to understand some basics about what His true nature and character is. And I tell you, most people have a misunderstanding about God and who He is. And so I think that this is really going to bless you. This was a teaching in Telford, England. We had about 3,000 people at the conference, and it was just an awesome time. So watch this as we air this uh, teaching that I did in Telford, England. You know, God laid some things on my heart for this week specifically. And I'm really excited about this. You've probably heard me say this, but I have to tell you when I'm excited because I'm always like this. <laughs> I actually went to Disney World and you know, when you go on those roller coasters, they take pictures of everybody, you know, screaming and stuff. And then at the end of the ride, they sell it to you. You could have taken a picture of me right now. And that's the way I looked on that roller coaster. <laughs> that's good in some ways. I guess it's bad in some ways. But I have to tell you when I'm excited, and I am really excited about what God is going to do. And praise God, we're believing God that this week we are going to see great and mighty miracles happen because Jesus is alive and Jesus wants to heal you. He wants to set you free. And specifically, the Lord spoke to me that He wants to reveal Himself to you. Instead of you coming to get healed or coming to get prospered or coming to get your needs met, what you need is an encounter with the Lord. And when you really connect with Him, everything that He is and has is yours. And I promise you, you'll be healed, you'll be delivered, you'll get whatever you need. And sometimes we can get our eyes so much on what we need that we forget that it's Jesus that we need more than the healing, more than anything else. And I believe that God is going to do some great things. I actually brought notes, which is nearly impossible for me to minister from. But the reason I did this is because God showed me specific things that He wants me to share with you. And I'm going to try and follow this and get through some things that God specifically spoke to me. But I'll confess to you up front, I'm not very good ministering from notes. But the Lord spoke to me that we need to really understand what His nature is, who God is. And there's a lot of people that have misunderstandings about God. And then I want to show who we are. And eventually I'm going to get to who we are in Christ, our new born again self. But I am going to share who we are without Christ. And this is important. I don't think most people have a revelation of this. Matter of fact, Stephen Bransford, the man that does our media department, we were in Denver coming here and both of us were getting our boots polished and we were talking to the man who was polishing our boots, and Stephen just asked him, he says, so, do you think people are basically good or basically bad? And he said, oh, they're basically good. Everybody's really good at their core, and if we just gave them the right environment and enough money and all of these things, then everybody would be good. And man, that is exactly opposite what the Bible teaches. And if you don't understand that, it's going to lead you to some wrong decisions some wrong things. So anyway, I'm going to be talking about who God is, who we are without Christ, and then who we are and what we have in Christ. And these things, many of the things that I'll be sharing may look like they're exact opposites of each other in the beginning. But it all ties together, and it really begins with you finding out who God is. 
If you don't understand the very nature and character of God, there is no way that you can really have a good relationship. And sad to say, this is where so many people are. They come to a meeting like this and you know that God exists, but you don't know Him. And I'm not talking about you aren't born again. You could be born again, but you don't have a relationship with Him. And therefore, it's easy for the devil to accuse you. And say, for instance, if you came for healing and if you don't instantly see something happen, you just fall for the lie that, well, God hasn't done anything. God didn't touch me. Because you don't know His nature and character and you're just going by what you feel and what you see and what somebody else has to say about Him. You need to know God, not just know about Him, but you need to know God. You cannot have a relationship with God if you don't first of all know His real nature and character. There is a lot of misinformation about God being put out. And a lot of it comes from the Bible. I'm going to be dealing with that tonight. A misinterpretation of the Bible. It says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, it says, Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. There is a right way to interpret the word and a wrong way. And sad to say, a lot of religious teaching today is giving a wrong understanding of God because it takes the Old Testament wrath that was released and they present that this is the nature and the character of God. There is no scripture that says God is wrath. There is a verse that says, 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, that God is love. And yet there is wrath from God revealed in the Old Testament. How do you rightly divide this? And this is what I want to talk about tonight and help you to see what the true nature of God is. It says in John chapter 8, verse 32, that you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. And so it's not good enough just to believe that there is a God and just to believe whatever you want to about Him. Let me say something right here that may shock some of you. But you know what idolatry is? A lot of people think, well, sure, idolatry is having some graven image and you pray to it or worship to it. Did you know idolatry is just making your own God? And there's many people that have not created an image and yet they have created their own God. I've actually heard people before say, well, I wouldn't worship a God that doesn't heal or that doesn't set free or that doesn't do this. Did you know I understand what they're saying, but that's really wrong because what you're saying is I'm going to only worship God if he's like this. You are creating a God in your own image. You are, you are, that's idolatry. What we've got to do is go to the Word of God. God revealed himself through his Word and we have to accept the revelation that He's given us. Now, it's wonderful that we do serve a good God, a gracious God, a merciful God, a forgiving God. God is absolutely better than any of us could ever imagine. I agree with that, but did you know what? I am not going to go and say, God, I'll serve you if this is the way you are. He's God, and I'm not, and I just have to accept the revelation that He has given in His Word. It says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And that word there, given by inspiration of God, if you look it up in the Greek, it literally means that the Scripture is God-breathed. The Scripture is not man revealing their thoughts about God. There's a lot of people that believe this, and they think that this is an old book, that it was people writing their opinions of God, and so therefore they cherry-pick the parts that they like and what they want, and they just believe that it's fallible, it's, it's written by man. But the Scripture says about itself that it is God-breathed. God inspired the Word of God through people. It also says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, it says, "...whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises," talking about the Word of God, "...that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust." The way you partake of God is through the Scripture. God revealed Himself, and we have to take the revelation that God's Word gives. 
So I just want to introduce this, introduce this tonight by saying that you don't need to sit here and have these things and say, well, I believe this is the way that God is. I believe God ought to be like this. I wouldn't worship a God who does this. You need to just drop those things and say, what does the revealed Word of God teach about Him? And that's what I'm going to share with you tonight. And I tell you, if you don't really understand the true nature and character of God, you'll never understand your new nature. You'll never understand a lot of things. We are His offspring. It is not up to us to create a God in our own image that we want. We have to take the revealed revelation of God's Word. And so there's so many scriptures that talk about this. I haven't got time to go through all of it. But the Bible has been misinterpreted and misapplied. And even the devil tried to use scripture on Jesus. Matthew chapter 4, Luke chapter 4, the devil said, If you be the Son of God, cast yourself down, for it is written, He shall give His angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. You know what he was doing? He was quoting Psalms chapter 91, verses 11 and 12. But here's what Psalms 91, 11 says. It says, For he shall give his angels charge over thee, and then it goes on to say, To keep thee in all thy ways. The devil just conveniently left that part of the scripture off, which means, see, he was just saying that God is going to protect you in anything you do, whether it's tempting him, whether it's going against his promises or not. That's not what the word of God says. So he left that part out and then he added some to it. It says, and in their hands, they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Satan said, lest at any time you dash your foot against a stone. So he took Bible truth, but he twisted it and applied it in a way that would have made it okay for Jesus to tempt God. And yet Jesus responded to him and said, get behind me, Satan. And he says, because it is written, and he quoted the scripture to him that you shall not tempt the Lord your God. So my point is that if Satan tried to use scripture on Jesus then you know what? You could misinterpret the scripture. You need to take the word of God and you need to rightly divide the word. Here's what it says in Hebrews chapter one, verses one and two. God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son whom he hath appointed heir of all things by whom also he made the worlds. This is saying that Jesus is a greater representation of God than anything that was ever said or done in the Old Testament. Not that the Old Testament was inaccurate, it was just incomplete. Jesus is the complete revelation of who God is. And in verse 3 it says, "...who being the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person and upholding all things by the word of His power, when He had by Himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus is the perfect representation. And that word that was translated right there, that He is the um, express image. Did you know that the Greek word there is the word character? It's spelled exactly like our English word character. This is the, where we get the word character from, and it literally means an exact copy. Jesus is an exact copy of God. He is the perfect representation. Jesus said this of himself. He says, uh, Have I been so long time with you, and yet thou hast not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father, and how sayest thou? Then show us the Father. Jesus was such a perfect representation of God, He was able to tell His disciples, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. In John chapter 5, verse 19, Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of Himself, but what He seeth the Father do. For what things soever He doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. I've actually had some people take that verse and say, well, this is showing that Jesus wasn't truly God because He said He couldn't do anything by Himself. It's actually just the opposite. This is Jesus claiming such a oneness with God the Father that they could not operate independent of each other. He couldn't do anything just of Himself. He and His Father were one is what He said. And if you have seen Him, then you have seen the Father and Jesus is the perfect representation. If you understand what He's saying right here, this answers a lot of questions about God. 
Some people think, well, is it God's will to heal everybody? Let me ask you, did Jesus ever put sickness on a person? Did Jesus ever say, no, you haven't learned your lesson yet. You aren't mature enough. You haven't suffered enough. I want you to suffer longer. There is not one single instance that Jesus ever refused to heal a person. There's a couple of times that people wouldn't receive the healing that he offered. It says in Mark chapter 6, verse 5, that he could do no mighty work, save that he laid his hand upon a few sick folk and healed them, and he marveled because of their unbelief. It wasn't Jesus who wasn't able to minister the healing. It was them that wouldn't receive it. But there is not one single instance of Jesus not healing a person. There is not one single instance of Jesus laying hands on a person and giving them sickness. And yet there are people in the church today that says God is the one that gave you this trial. God is the one who wants you to be sick. They will say it's punishment for sin. Or sometimes they'll say that you're learning something by this. This is how God breaks you and makes you a better person. If that was true, well, then Jesus didn't accurately represent the Father because He never made a single person sick. He never refused to heal a person. He never sent anybody away unhealed. It says in Acts chapter 10, verse 38, how that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with power and with the Holy Ghost who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Jesus also set people free from demonic things. It's not God's will for a single person to be suffering under emotional things. If you are experiencing any of those things, if you're listening to what I'm saying, God is revealing Himself to you that Jesus came to set you free. It's the devil who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. John chapter 10, verse 10, but Jesus came to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly. See, you need to take what the Word says right here and say, God, I know that my suffering, my problems, this is not you. This is not you. It's not God who's turned a deaf ear to you. There's multiple things at work, but somehow or another, it's the devil or your ignorance or your rebellion or there could be multiple things involved, but it's not God who is not healing you. It's not God who hasn't set you free. It's not God who's not given you an abundant life because He came to give you life and give it to you more abundantly. It says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, the last part of that verse, it says that God is love. That is who God is. That is His nature. That's the core of God. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus came to keep you from perishing. And this isn't talking about just going to hell. That's the extreme. That's the ultimate. But He came to give you life right now and to give you joy and peace. You don't have to wait until you die and go to heaven to start experiencing heaven. Jesus said to pray, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He wants you to have heaven here on earth. It's not just pie in the sky by and by, but it's steak on the plate while you wait. (laughs) Amen. God wants you to be blessed. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19 says that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto Himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. This is how He's able to extend grace to you. And when I get into talking about who we are in Christ and who we are in just our natural self without Christ, I'll explain this a lot more in detail, and I think it'll really help you to understand it. But in Christ, we are now reconciled unto God. How did He reconcile us? By not imputing our trespasses unto us. This is another great revelation about God is that He is not holding your sins against you. And brothers and sisters, the vast majority of the body of Christ does not understand this. The vast majority of the body of Christ believes that God is dealing with them according to their sins. And there's different degrees of this. Some people will believe that any sin in your life, God won't answer your prayers if you have any sin and they will just sit there and make you feel so depressed and so discouraged because your own heart will condemn you 
and recognize that you're falling short. And I have met hundreds, probably thousands of people who knew that God exists. They had had a touch from God, but they just couldn't live perfectly. And they thought they had to be perfect before God would answer their prayers. And they just finally despaired of it and went the other direction, not because they didn't believe that God exists. They just thought, there's no way I can meet this standard. But then there's other people that believe, well, you won't go to hell. You won't necessarily be hated by God, but He won't answer your prayers. He won't bless you. He won't use you. But this verse says that He does not impute our trespasses unto us. All of our sins have been atoned for, past, present, and even future sins. Sins you hadn't even committed yet have been put upon the Lord Jesus and He forgave you of sins that you haven't even committed yet. And I know somebody's thinking, how can God forgive a sin before I commit it? You better pray that He can <laughs> because He only died for your sins one time 2,000 years ago and if He can't forgive sins before you commit them, then you can't be forgiven. He can forgive sins. Your sins have been forgiven. Now, does that mean that you're free to go live in sin. I'll be dealing with this in more detail too. But no, even though God is not bringing His judgment on sin, Satan gains inroad to you through your sin. So if you go out and are living in sin, Satan is going to eat your lunch and... There you go. So you do not want to live in sin. It's just stupid. Quit living in sin. But what I'm saying is God loves you, stupid. Amen. He's not holding your sins against you, but Satan will make you pay if you're living in sin. So quit doing it. I was using so much cocaine that I was really completely out of myself. I had a few times I put a gun against my head and I just wanted to blow my brains out. I said, God, if you really, really exist, if you are really, really God, you need to help me because I'm gonna die. As the number one ecstasy dealer in Portugal, Johan had it all, money, power, a family, everything that the world says will make you happy. And yet he hated himself. To numb this self-rejection, Johan buried himself in cocaine and one day found himself in a Portugal prison where at the lowest point in his life, God reached out to him. One night I was sitting on, the, uh, on my bed and suddenly out of nothing, an image came where I heard my mom and the pain on the face of my mom shocked me. And now I saw it and I felt it. And then Another image came into my mind, and another image came into my mind, and of all the people that I heard, there was like a, a thousand kilos was pushing me down. I couldn't get up from the floor. And then suddenly my cell was filled with a light that was so bright, it looked like the sun was shining in my cell. I was screaming, forgive me. God, forgive me, please forgive me. Forgive me, Father, forgive me. I don't, I, I don't know why I become that person. I don't want that person anymore. I don't want to be that person anymore. Please forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. But he just hushed me. He just hushed me. He says, you're already forgiven. And I just had an ocean of love overflowing me. I mean, a tsunami of love and grace overflowing me. And I was washed from the inside out and from the outside in. After serving 10 years in prison, Johan was released back to his wife, Brenda, in Holland. And while searching to know more about the God he met in captivity, the Holy Spirit led him to Bible teacher, Andrew Womack. Suddenly, I was thrown back into the same freedom that I had when I was receiving Jesus in my prison cell. Then the Bible became more alive and I started praying in a different way and I see all these things changing in my life. From there, Johan and Brenda enrolled into Andrew's school, Karis Netherlands, where they saw God's Word restore their marriage and heal all the wounds from their past. It was at this time that God called them to start the One in Him Foundation, a ministry where they are now sharing the love of Jesus all around the world. To see Johan's full grace encounter, visit awmi.net.
it's better to give Jesus a hand. Amen. Because he done all the work. Amen. And of Hallelujah. course, there's so much more that we could share than what that little video showed. But tell them about... Uh, your healing that you had. That yes. is absolutely Amen. miraculous. Well, uh, we've been uh, through a lot of uh, mission trips to Brazil and um, uh, basically there was an outbreak of uh, yellow fever and it's a deadly virus. And uh, I never am stung by any mosquitoes, but uh, that time I was stung by a mosquito and uh, I had the yellow fever. I didn't know it, but when I went back to Holland, uh, the doctors told me, ah, we got some bad news for you. Uh, you have yellow fever, your organs gonna bleed. You're going to be turning into yellow and, you're going to, and you can probably die. I said, well, first of all, let me stop you there. Yellow is not my color. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Some people are yellow, but it's not my color. My organs are not going to bleed and I am not going to die because I'm going to live. That's what my father says. I break it in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. So uh, when, I, when they told me the next day, I was healed. So, uh, you know, that's cool. But um, that's basically the father that we are serving, you know? And now I know my daddy, God is my father, and all the other things that I desire in my life, he is giving it to us. We live in prosperity, we live in supernatural health, he restored our family, our children, our marriage, and I've got so many testimonies, I can speak on till tomorrow morning, and I won't be, you know, it's, it will never end. We got a good God. Hallelujah. All right, Brenda, let's hear from you. How is your oh life? Oh, my. Well, we, we've been together for 24 years. And only the last year since we've been through Caris Bible College, Amen. only then started our marriage. And now we're walking with Jesus. I, I would encourage everybody who's in here, just go to a school nearby because it's going to change your life. On today's broadcast, you saw an excerpt from Andrew's teaching titled, Who God Is and Who We Are, recorded live from a 2019 Grace and Faith Conference in Telford, England. This four-part teaching is available as a CD album, DVD album, or USB. Each of these valuable resources are available for a gift of any amount when you contact us. Also available is the entire 2019 Grace and Faith Conference, which includes all four of Andrew's sessions, along with teachings from guest speakers Wendell Parr and Dwayne Sheriff. This conference was recorded live in Telford, England, and is available as a nine-part CD album, DVD album, or USB when you contact us. You can become a Grace Partner through our website at awmi.net. While there, you can discover more product details and download additional free resources. You can also order resources or receive prayer by calling our helpline at 719-635-1111. Our helpline is open 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. To write us, use the address on your screen. We appreciate your generosity and hope to hear from you today. Welcome to a special edition of Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. Today, Andrew continues his teaching on who God is and who we are, recorded live from the 2019 Grace and Faith Conference in Telford, England. You need to recognize that you were an absolute mess before Jesus saved you. Apart from God's influence in your life, you just don't realize how perfect God created us to be. And now, here's Andrew. All of our sins have been atoned for, past, present, and even future sins. Sins you hadn't even committed yet have been put upon the Lord Jesus and He forgave you of sins that you haven't even committed yet. And I know somebody's thinking, how can God forgive a sin before I commit it? You better pray that he can. <laughs> because he only died for your sins one time 2,000 years ago. And if he can't forgive sins before you commit them, then you can't be forgiven. He can forgive sins. Your sins have been forgiven. Now, does that mean that you're free to go live in sin? I'll be dealing with this in more detail too. But no, even though God is not bringing his judgment on sin... Satan gains inroad to you through your sin. So if you go out and are living in sin, 
Satan is going to eat your lunch and there you go. So you do not want to live in sin. It's just stupid. Quit living in sin. But what I'm saying is God loves you, stupid. Amen. He's not holding your sins against you, but Satan will make you pay if you're living in sin. So quit doing it. And so some people are saying, well, you know, but the Old Testament shows God judging people. For instance, Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 and 2 says, My hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor my ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God. And so the, in the Old Testament, God was separated from man over sin. And because of it, there was judgment upon sin. I can show you instances where God sent a death angel out and killed 183,000 uh, men in one night in the Syrian army. I can show you where God struck people with leprosy, where things happened. And people say, well, man, the Bible says God is love. That doesn't look like love to me. Well, in the old covenant, there was a difference between the way God deals with sin and the way he deals with it now. And I'll go into more explanation on this later as we get further into it. But basically, the difference is that you and I are now new creatures. And because we, one translation of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, you are a new species of being that never existed before. And because of that, God can treat you differently than he could treat an Old Testament person who was living under the law and was basically getting what you deserve. We don't get what we deserve today. We get what Jesus deserves. And so some people says, well... Is he the God of the New Testament or the God of the Old Testament? Is he angry or is he in a good mood today? Well, the Bible says that he's the Lord and he changes not. Malachi 3, 6, I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. So some people think, well, how do you reconcile the Old Testament and the New Testament? It's because... God didn't give the law so that you could keep it. And this is one of the big mistakes that people make when they are reading the word and trying to figure out God. They see the wrath and the punishment of God and they just assume that God is this hard, angry God. But you know, the scripture says that he changes not. He hasn't changed but we have changed and God deals with New Testament believers differently than he dealt with Old Testament believers. Let me just give you some quick examples here. In Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10, it says, The man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. That's Leviticus 20.10. Deuteronomy 22.22 says, If a man be found lying with a woman married to a husband, then they shall both of them die, both the man that lay with the woman and the woman, so shalt thou put away evil from Israel. That was in the Old Testament, and this was how God commanded sin to be dealt with, and because of that, there are some people that just have this hatred for anybody who has committed adultery. Now, we need to hate adultery because adultery is bad. It gives Satan an inroad into our life. It, it causes all kinds of damage. But look at how Jesus dealt with a woman taken in the very act of adultery in John chapter 8. And she was brought to Jesus and the scribes and the Pharisees, they hated Jesus and they were trying to entrap him and they thought they had him because of these verses I just read to you. According to the law, you had to kill any person who committed adultery, and if you didn't kill them, then you could be killed for not upholding and enforcing the Word of God. So they brought this woman taken in the very act of adultery, and they thought they had Jesus. Here's what the law says, Jesus, but what do you say? And Jesus just bent over and wrote on the ground like he didn't even hear them at first. And finally, they kept pressing him. What do you say? They thought they had him. And he stood up and he said, He that's without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. And of course, none of them were without sin. And it says they left being convicted of their own conscience. 
Their own heart showed them that there wasn't a one of them that was without sin. And so all of the accusers left. Now, Jesus did not say that what she did wasn't sin. Matter of fact, he even told her, he says, where's all of your accusers? And she said, no man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. That's in verse 11. So he called it sin. It was sin what she did, but he didn't enforce the Old Testament wrath. How could he get by with doing that? See, the difference is that God never wanted to hold our sins against us. In Romans chapter 5, it says that sin is not imputed when there is no law. This tells you why God waited 2,000 years until the time of Moses before He gave the Old Testament law because He didn't want to hold our sins against us. The very first person that sinned after Adam and Eve was Cain, their son, and Cain killed his brother Abel. And when God found out about it, God was talking to him and Cain says... I have nowhere to go. I'll be a vagabond. Every person that tries to, every person that finds me will try and kill me. And God set a mark upon Cain and said, If any man avenges Abel's death, I'll avenge your death sevenfold. God protected the very first murderer that was on the face of the earth. But did you know that later, once the law was given, the very first person who broke the law was a man who picked up sticks on the Sabbath day so that he could make a fire and cook him a meal. And what did they do with him? They brought him before the Lord because it was said that you had to keep the Sabbath, but it didn't say specifically what the punishment for that was. And so they shut him up and they asked God what they should do. And God said, stone him to death, kill him. Can you see the difference before the law when grace was reigning and after the law? Before the law... Cain killed his brother Abel, and he was protected. Not, it wasn't God approving of what he did, but God extended mercy and grace and protected him. But the first person who broke the law was a man who picked up sticks, and they said, put him to death. Once the law was given, God held people's sins against them. And here is the reason that he basically did that. This is a misconception that people have. They think that the law was given for me to keep. That wasn't the purpose of the law. Now, there is benefit in keeping the law as much as you can, but nobody can keep it perfectly. And it says in James chapter 2, verse 10, if you keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, you become guilty of everything. It's not like if you make 99 out of 100 questions and you get 99 right. You don't get 99 on God's test. You get a zero. If you miss one thing, if you break any precept of the law, you become guilty of it all. God did not give the law so that you could keep it and thereby earn relationship with God. But God gave the law to reveal sin to us. Romans chapter 3 verse 20, by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law was given to show you your sin. And God didn't want us to know how sinful we were in the beginning. You know, if he wanted to, he could have shown Adam and Eve, look what your sin did. And if he just went down every person here and showed the pain and the suffering and the death that has happened in every person's life, I don't think that Adam and Eve could have lasted. I don't think that they'd have been able to handle it. If he had shown them what Hitler did, the millions of people, Stalin, the tens of millions of people that were murdered and things. If he had shown all of that to Adam and Eve, they couldn't have handled it. He didn't want them to know how bad a sinner they were, and he was willing to extend grace unto mankind. But mankind began to take God's lack of punishment as approval. They began to lose their sense of right and wrong because they were comparing themselves among themselves and measuring themselves by themselves, which the Bible says is not wise. But you can see this in the fourth chapter of the book of Genesis that uh, Cain had killed Abel. And then in that same chapter, Genesis chapter 4, Cain's great, great, great grandson, Lamech, comes along and kills a man in self-defense. 
And he felt so much more justified in his murder than what Cain was that he said, if God avenges Cain sevenfold, he'll avenge Lamech seventy and sevenfold. But see, that was wrong. God didn't say that. That was Lamech. He was comparing himself with Cain and thinking, Cain got by with murder. Surely I'll get by with murder. And over a period of time, there just began to be murder. There began to be rape. There began to be lawlessness. And people were comparing themselves. And I know some of you are thinking, well, how terrible was that? Man, we are doing the exact same thing. Because people who are royalty, people who are uh, movie stars, people who are, are athletes and famous and making lots of money, they live in sin and it doesn't seem to bother them. And so we've lowered our standards. And today we have parades announcing gay pride and people just you know, pumping their fist in the face of God and things are changing. And today, most people are more influenced by their culture than they are by the Word of God. So for that reason, God gave the law to show you what sin was so that you would quit going out and just living in sin and also to take away the self-salvation, self-righteousness that religious people had. Because there's a lot of religious people that think, well, I'm better than this person over here. I fast twice in the week. I pay tithes of mint and anise and cumin. That's what the Pharisees said, see, about the publican over here. But God said that the Pharisee wasn't justified. The publican was the one who was justified because he says, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And so to bring people out of that deception and to let them see that they can't trust in themselves. God gave the law that you might be doing better than I am. You might be living holier than me or holier than somebody else, but who wants to be the best sinner that ever went to hell? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If you miss heaven by an inch, you miss it by a mile. You can't just be good. You can't do your best. You either have to be perfect or you need a Savior who died for you and gave you His perfection. And so there were a lot of people like me. I've never gotten drunk in my life. I've never gone out and used profanity. I've never done all of these things that people talk about. And yet I needed salvation. How does God reach a religious person who's good enough that they think, well, you know, compared to other people, I'm okay. God gave such a standard that was so far beyond our reach that it made you despair of self-salvation. You know, if it was just up to you and you're saying, well, I believe I'm basically a good person. I don't know if any of you have ever seen these interviews that Ray Comfort does. I don't know if you have that over here, but in the United States... Ray Comfort is just really good. And he'll go up to people on college campuses and he has a microphone in his hand and he says, so do you believe that uh, good people go to heaven? And they'll, oh yeah. Did you know it just so happens that our present Pope said that even an atheist, if they're a good person, will go to heaven. That's wrong. That's not what the Bible reveals about God. So this Ray Comfort will ask people and says, do you believe good people go to heaven? Oh, yes. Do you believe you're a good person? Oh, yes, I'm a good person. So are you going to go to heaven? Oh, yeah, I'll go to heaven. And then he'll say, well, have you ever lied? Yes. Now, oh, well, yes, I've lied. And then he'll read to them. It says all liars will have their part in the lake of fire, which burns forever. And he'll quote that verse to them and they'll say, so if you lie, well, yes, so... All liars will go to hell. Are you going to go? Are you good enough then? And they'll start doubting it. And then he'll start mentioning other things. If you hate your neighbor in your heart, you're guilty of murder. If you lust after a person in your heart, you're guilty of adultery. And he'll just go through and name these things. And pretty soon they'll be saying, you know, I don't think I am going to go to heaven. That was the purpose of the law was to show you that if you think you're good, are you perfect? It says in Romans 3, 23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. God's standard isn't our present day standard. Today, we allow homosexuality, we allow adultery, we allow lying and stealing and just all kinds of things. 
And we have lowered the bar so far that nearly anybody can step over the uh, morality thing. You know, again, if you are setting your own standards and you're saying, I believe that this is acceptable. I don't care what the Bible says. I don't care what God revealed. I don't care about God's morality. Here's what my standard of morality is. Then you know what? You are making yourself God. God's the only one that has a right to set what right and wrong is. He's the one that created us. And when you change the rules and you say, I think that this is okay, well, then you've put yourself in God's place. It's idolatry. Thank you for that thunderous silence. <laughs> I know what I'm saying is countering our culture. But I'm telling you, this is what the Bible reveals about God. So Ray Comfort will ask all of these people and eventually they'll be saying, oh man, I need salvation. That's what the purpose of the law was for, was to show you that God's standard is higher than you can make. Here's man's standard down here and you can fall across it. There's no problem at all. God will just raise the bars so high that it'll make you say, well, God, if this is the standard that you consider to be normal, well then God, have mercy on me a sinner. That's the purpose of the law. So the reason I say all of this is to show you that the reason God revealed His wrath against sin was because He had to show us what sin was because we were comparing ourselves among ourselves and we were losing sight of what true morality was. And He had to take away our self-righteousness so that you would quit trusting in yourself and comparing yourself with other people. But remember that for 2,000 years... God did not reveal that wrath. Matter of fact, these verses, I think I got sidetracked here, but I read these verses about adultery. Did you know that Abraham broke Leviticus chapter 18, which says that if you marry a half-sister, then it's punishable by death? Sarah was Abraham's half-sister, and yet he didn't have God rebuke him. Matter of fact, God called him a friend. Of God, The only person in the Old Testament that was called a friend of God. And it was a man who was living in a sexual abomination according to Leviticus chapter 18. And if you broke those standards in Leviticus 18, you had to be put to death. Abraham wasn't put to death. He became the patriarch because it was before God started holding man's sins against them. He was dealing with the human race in mercy and in grace because that's the way that God wanted to deal with people. But people were taking his lack of punishment as approval and therefore just living in sin. And so God had to do something to restrain the amount of sin. And then also Jacob came along, who is Abraham's grandson, and Jacob married two women who were sisters. And here's what it says in Genesis chapter 29, verse 16, it says, And Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah. The name of the younger was Rachel. And Jacob married Leah and Rachel. And according to Leviticus 18, 18, it says, Neither shalt thou take a wife to her sister to vex her, to uncover her nakedness besides the other in her lifetime. And yet Jacob did it. And guess what? Jacob wrestled with an angel in Genesis chapter 32, and actually came out ahead and the angel blessed him. Here's a man who was living in a sexual abomination that was so strong with God that he prevailed against an angel and won a blessing. And if he would have lived under the law, he'd have been put to death. God was not imputing man's sins unto them and the very fact that he waited 2,000 years to do it shows you that this wasn't God's first and best choice. He was willing to deal in mercy, but people were taking his lack of punishment and they were, they were losing their sense of right and wrong and they were thinking, I'm good enough. So God gave the law to show us how ungodly we were and it caused some problems. I don't know if you all have it over here, but in the United States, if, if they advertise these medicines in the United States, we've got laws that says you have to show what the side effects are. Do you do that over here? And so they'll advertise some product and they'll say, take this pill, it'll heal your headache. But then they'll say, it could cause death. It'll cause impotence. It'll cause this. And I mean, they go through all of this stuff and I think, man, give me back the headache. It's better than all of the side effects. 
But in a sense, that's the way the law was. The law did two things really well. It showed you what sin was. And there are scriptures that say that was the purpose of the law is to show you the knowledge of sin. And it took away self-righteousness and showed you that you could never be holy enough. You could never live good enough. So it did accomplish some good things. And there still is a purpose of the law today. I'll probably deal with that more this week as I go through it. So the law accomplished some good things, but the side effects of it were guilt, condemnation, shame, and feeling like, oh God, how could you love anybody like me? If this is your standard, I'm so unworthy and ungodly. And so it did some good things, but it also accomplished a lot of guilt and a lot of condemnation. And in the new covenant, a New Testament believer has to get out from under the law and feeling like you've got to relate to God based on your performance or it will cause guilt, condemnation. Romans 8, 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. The righteousness of the law is now fulfilled in us, not in our physical bodies but in our spirit through faith in Christ. And you have to purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Uh, Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 14 says that. So anyway, the law had a purpose, but it revealed the wrath of God. And sad to say, most New Testament believers have not understood the purpose. They thought God gave the law so that we could keep it and thereby earn relationship with God based on our performance. And if that's what you think, it gives you a wrong impression of God. The seed, the ministry, I can't tell you how grateful we are as a family. <laughs> On today's broadcast, you saw an excerpt from Andrew's teaching titled, Who God Is and Who We Are, recorded live from a 2019 Grace and Faith Conference in Telford, England. This four-part teaching is available as a CD album DVD album, or USB. Each of these valuable resources are available for a gift of any amount when you contact us. Also available is the entire 2019 Grace and Faith Conference, which includes all four of Andrew's sessions, along with teachings from guest speakers Wendell Parr and Dwayne Sheriff. This conference was recorded live in Telford, England, and is available as a nine-part CD album DVD album, or USB when you contact us. You can become a Grace Partner through our website at awmi.net. While there, you can discover more product details and download additional free resources. You can also order resources or receive prayer by calling our helpline at 719-635-1111. Our helpline is open 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. To write us, use the address on your screen. We appreciate your generosity and hope to hear from you today. Am I a mistake? Did God overlook Why me? Why do I still deal with depression? I need direction. Why does life feel meaningless? Have I wasted my life? Why, so so Why don't I know what to do? Have I blown it? God's people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. If you've got any problem in your life, it's really because you don't understand fully what God has done. This word is the greatest gift that God has ever given us because this is how we know Him. I'm promising you preparation time is never wasted time. Regardless of what you feel that God has called you to do, you need to be prepared. At Karis Bible College, you will be transformed by the Word of God. You will develop your relationship with God and ability to hear His voice. That is what is going to transform your life, your vision, and your future. It's not too late. Stop disqualifying yourself. No matter who you are or what you've done, God still has a plan for you. Learn more at karisbiblecollege.org. All right, so in the name of Jesus, here we go. One, two, three. We have officially broke ground. Praise God. 
Thanks to the support of our friends and partners, Andrew has continued the expansion of our Karis Bible College campus so that we can raise up more disciples to take the gospel further and deeper than ever before. Because you play such an important role in raising up this next generation, Andrew has decided to give monthly construction updates so that you can see the progress of what your giving and prayers have produced. Visit awmi.net slash Karis Campus to see our most recent update today. I want to let you know that we now have a Truth and Liberty live call-in show every weekday and you can tune in from 3.30 to 5 p.m. Mountain Time and we are going to be discussing not only spiritual things but political things, just anything. It's a live call-in. You will actually get put on the air and we will interact with you and I believe it's going to be a blessing to you. So remember that's every weekday from 3.30 to 5 o'clock p.m. for our Truth and Liberty live call-in show. Andrew has many conferences and seminars around the globe each year. For the latest information on Andrew's complete speaking schedule, visit our website at awmi.net slash events. You know, I want to share with you about my living commentary. For those of you that don't know, this is a digital version of a Bible commentary. And I have literally gone through dozens and dozens of books and study guides to compile all of this. And I put it into a form in this living commentary that saves you all of that study. Plus, it's all of the insight that God has given me over 51 years of ministry is all poured into there. And we've devised this in such a way that you can put your little cursor over a scripture that is being quoted and it automatically pops that scripture up. You don't have to leave that screen and go somewhere else and then come back. And there are Greek and Hebrew words defined. There are commentaries that are on there. There's my footnotes. There's a treasury of scripture knowledge. Uh, there's different versions of the scripture. Check out our living commentary. It will be a tremendous blessing to you. Welcome to a special edition of Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. Today, Andrew continues his teaching on who God is and who we are, recorded live from the 2019 Grace and Faith Conference in Telford, England. You need to recognize that you were an absolute mess before Jesus saved you. Apart from God's influence in your life, you just don't realize how perfect God created us to be. And now, here's Andrew. The law had a purpose, but it revealed the wrath of God. And sad to say, most New Testament believers have not understood the purpose. They thought God gave the law so that we could keep it and thereby earn relationship with God based on our performance. And if that's what you think, it gives you a wrong impression of God. You know, it's like a parent training their children. When your child is little, you have to teach that child that selfishness is not a good thing. And yet every one of us came into this world 100% selfish. You may not have thought about it, but you were. You know, if you had a child in this service right now, we had a child a while ago screaming over here, I don't know what was going on. But you know what? Children, they don't care about anybody but themselves. They don't care if there's a thousand people, five thousand people here, whatever, that want to hear the word. All they think about is themselves. And they'll throw a fit, they'll scream, they'll do anything because they are the center of the universe. <laughs> and every one of us started that way. The sad fact is, most of us are still that way. <laughs> we just now throw adult fits. We've learned how to manage it, but it's still the same principle. But anyway, when your child is little, you have to teach them that selfishness isn't the right thing. You have to correct a child. The Word of God says the rod and reproof gives wisdom. And you know what? When they're one year old, two years old, you can't just sit down and explain things to them. You can't say, now, if you go over there and take that toy, you're being selfish. And that is from the devil. 
And if you keep giving in to selfishness, you'll never have any friends because it'll all be about you. You'll never be able to keep a job. Your marriage will fall apart because you're just... If you try and tell a two-year-old that stuff, they won't understand it. But you know what you can tell a two-year-old? You do that again and I'll give you a spanking. And they may not even know there is a God or devil or heaven or a hell. They may not know anything spiritual, but the next time they want to go steal something, take something, they'll think about a spanking and they'll go, no. <laughs> and you can train a child to resist evil through corporal punishment. In a sense, that's what the law was. People, it says over in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, that the natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Before people got born again, they couldn't understand things the way that we can. It's through our spirit that we have the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2, 16. And you have an ability to understand God in a way that a person who's not born again didn't have. So before the New Testament, before people got born again, how is it that you teach them to do the right thing? The law is real clear. Go do this and I'll kill you. I'll smite you with the botch, with the mildew, with them rods, amen. If you don't tithe, I'll curse you with the curse. And you know what? Even a lost man understands that. A lost man will, they'll shell out. They'll give in the offering if they are condemned. But under the new covenant, we've got a new way of responding to God. Like over in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, it says, don't give grudgingly or of necessity because God loves a cheerful giver. Give the way you purpose in your heart. It's different under the new covenant than under the old covenant. Why? Because God changed? No, but we changed. We are now born again and we're a brand new person and God can deal with us differently. And God did not just all of a sudden change and say, all right, now I'm not going to hold people's sins against them. I'm not going to punish them anymore. That's what a lot of people think grace is about. That God now is just full of grace, whereas in the Old Testament, He was full of wrath. No, God is the same. He does not change. You know what happened? God placed all of His wrath upon Jesus. And he, he took every bit of wrath and punishment that He had and put your sin and my sin in Jesus. And He punished that sin in Jesus. So God is now just to treat you just as if you never sinned because your sin has been paid for. He didn't just say, all right, I'm going to quit holding people's sin against. No, he paid for that. That's like, you know, if I did something wrong and I went before the judge and the judge turns out one of my best friends, I think, man, this is awesome. I'm going to get out of this because he's my friend. But if he's a just judge, he'll go ahead and give sentence whether I'm his friend or not. That wouldn't be right for him just to say, well, you're my friend. I'm going to let you go. So the judge brings down the gavel and brings judgment upon me. And I said, I thought you were my friend. But then he gets out from behind his desk, comes around, takes his robe off, and he pays my fine for me. See, that's what Jesus did. Jesus didn't just say, all right, I'm going to let you go and not execute judgment. No, he did execute judgment. He took it upon himself. He suffered for your sin and for my sin, and he paid the debt, and now... There is nothing left for you to pay. Amen. Praise God. Look at this passage in John chapter 12. This is Jesus speaking right before his crucifixion. And in John chapter 12, he says in verse 28, Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people therefore that stood by heard it and said that it thundered. Others said, an angel spake unto him. But Jesus answered, this voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. 
You know, I used to interpret this that if you just preach Jesus properly and if you present the gospel accurately, that it'll draw large numbers of people. That's not what this is talking about. And that is not a true statement. Some of the places that have the biggest churches, the biggest crowds are not preaching the true gospel. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but that's absolutely true statement. There's a lot of people that compromise and draw people through entertainment and smoke and mirrors and things like that. It is not true that if you just preach Jesus properly, he'll draw lots of people. The word men right here is italicized. And in the King James Bible, the one that, you know, Paul used, the King James Bible, they were honest enough that when they translated something that wasn't in the original text, they would put it in italics to let you know that this was their interpretation. It wasn't in the original language. So what this actually says is, I, if I be lifted up, will draw all unto me. All what? Well, they just assumed it was talking about all men. But the verse in front of it, says, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And the verse after it says, this he said, signifying what death he should die. It wasn't talking about drawing all men unto him. It was talking about bringing all judgment unto him. And so this is saying that when Jesus hung on the cross, he was like a lightning rod, that every bit of God's wrath that the Old Testament law said would come, Every judgment that God had against you and against me, He put it on Jesus. And Jesus literally bore your grief, carried your sorrow. He was bruised for your iniquity. The chastisement of your peace was upon Him. God put all of His wrath against you and me upon Jesus so that now He's not just looking the other way. He has paid the price. Your, your debt has been paid. It's done. There's nothing left for you to pay. And now we can experience a grace of God that Old Testament people couldn't. The only way that an Old Testament man could experience the grace that you and I experience is by looking forward to what Jesus did. And they would offer an animal sacrifice and they would literally take their hands and they would lay their hands upon the head of this animal and lean on it. What that was, they were transferring their weight, their sin to this animal and then they would slit its throat and offer it because the wages of sin is death. Sin has to be paid for by death. And God allowed people to put their sins upon an animal in symbolism. It wasn't accurate. It even says that in Hebrews chapter 9. It was just, the, it says the blood of bulls and of goats could never take away sin. It was a symbolic thing, but through faith, in a sense, God paid Old Testament saints' sins on credit, put it on what Jesus was going to do. They looked forward to what Jesus was going to do. We look back to what Jesus has already done. And because of that, we can truthfully stand before God just as if I'd never sinned, justified because of what Jesus has done. Amen. So I said all of this to try and harmonize some things. There are people that will read 1 John 4, 8, where it says that God is love. And then they'll turn over to the Old Testament where God struck Miriam with leprosy, where God put sickness on a person, where God did something, and they'll say, how is that love? And then they come up with these weird doctrines. The Old Testament was God's wrath revealed for a brief period of time. We've basically had 6,000 years since Adam and Eve sinned. The first 2,000 years, God was not imputing man's trespasses unto them. Romans chapter 5, verse 13 says so. He didn't impute their trespasses. Then the law came where he did hold their trespasses against them and said, your sins have separated. But then since Jesus came, he put all of our sin and his wrath for our sin upon Jesus. And so for 2,000 years, there has once again been the grace and the mercy of God ruling and reigning. And it says that in Romans chapter 5, verse 21 talking about that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might righteousness reign uh, uh, through Christ Jesus. And so we now, over 6,000 years, we've had 4,000 years that God has been trying to deal with us in grace and in mercy. 
That's the true nature of God. He only gave the law temporarily. Galatians chapter 3 says it was temporary until the seed should come to whom the promises were made. And that was talking about Jesus. So I've said all of these things to show you that God is love. And there was a period of time that he dealt with sins in anger and judgment because he was going to show us what we deserved. So it would take away our deception that, you know, God's just got to accept all of us. No, God doesn't have to accept anybody. And it's not based on how holy you are compared to me. Here's God's standard. He showed us a standard that was so holy that it condemned us and shut us up under the faith that would afterwards be revealed through Jesus. That was the purpose of the Old Testament law. But God is a God of love. God wants you well. God wants you blessed. God loves you more than you love yourself. God wants to prosper you more than you want to be prospered. And again, I wish I had time to just share with you so many scriptures, but the Word of God reveals this goodness of God and specifically Jesus. Jesus takes the woman in the very act of adultery and turns around and doesn't say that what she did wasn't sin, but He says, if you're without sin, you cast the first stone. He wouldn't let them punish her because He was going to take her punishment. Jesus became an adulteress when he hung on the cross. He took that adultery into his own body and suffered the payment for that. And that's the true nature of God. God loves you in spite of who you are, not because of who you are. And if you don't understand that and you are being told that you've got to perform and get holy enough so that God will answer your prayer or heal you or deliver you or heal your marriage and you're trying to earn it, Satan will use that wrong thinking to discourage you and stop you. Did you know Satan can't accuse Jesus? When you receive what I'm talking about and your whole attention is on Jesus, Jesus is perfect, Jesus is holy, and Satan cannot impugn his character. But if you think you've got to be holy to deserve God's goodness, boy, Satan can always find something to accuse you over and you will wind up losing your faith. Not because you doubt Jesus is holy, but you think you've got to be holy to earn it. And that will stop you. You're the weak link in the chain. You can't relate to God based on your goodness. You've got to totally put your faith in Jesus and what He's done for you and not your own goodness. And this is where so many people are missing God. They don't understand the true nature and the character of God. God is a good God. He is holy and He's perfect. And you know that you aren't. And so you feel this great gulf between you and God. But I'm telling you that Jesus took all of your sin and bore it for you. And He paid for your sins. It says 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, that He is the propitiation. That means the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Jesus has paid for the sins of the whole world. Not only Christians. Unbelievers have had all of their sins paid for. And some people say, well, then that means that they're okay then. No, because they have to mix it with faith. Romans chapter 5 verse 2 says that we have access into this grace through faith. Faith is how you receive what Jesus has done. And if you don't put faith in Jesus, then even though He paid for your sins and the payment has been paid, it will profit you nothing unless you put faith in Jesus. So you have to, you have to receive this. If you doubt, you do without. You got to believe. But Jesus has paid it all. And if you can receive it, now you are in right standing with God it's just as if you'd never sinned. God loves you. God is seeing you in the Spirit. I'll deal with this more this week and explain it in more detail. But God sees you righteous and holy and pure because when you got born again, He created you righteous. You are a brand new creature on the inside. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. God sees you differently than you see yourself. And if you can understand it, God is passionate about you. God loves you. God carries your picture in His wallet. 
God loves you. That is who God is. That is his nature. God is love. But man, you've got to understand it. Did you know that God will be to you what you think him to be? Now, that's a statement that you might have to think about. God is who he is, regardless of what you think. But God, as far as your experience goes, he will never force himself upon you. He doesn't make things happen without your cooperation. You have to reach out and receive and cooperate. And so if you think that God is not going to bless you because you don't deserve it, then that will stop God from blessing you because you won't believe for freedom. You won't believe for grace. You will believe only that you get what you deserve. And that's what you will experience. That's not the right way to be. So how you see God, if you have a misunderstanding, if you see Him as the one who puts troubles on you, and He's putting sickness on you and poverty and all of these things to break you, well, then what that will do, that'll make you passive when pr troubles come into your life. And the Bible says in James 4, 7, that you resist the devil and he'll flee from you. The word resist means to actively fight against. You can't be passive. You've got to resist the devil and he will flee from you. But if you think God is the one who's putting problems into your life, then you can't resist those things or you would wind up resisting God. So it'll make you passive and you will experience all kinds of problems and things that God never intended for you to have. And you'll accept it thinking that it's God. So it's important that you get the right impression of God. God is a good God and you've got to find out who God is, not who you want Him to be, not who you've been told that He is, you need to go to the Word of God and let the Word of God reveal to you who God is and then you need to start relating to Him based on the revelation that He gave us. You know, one last thing let me say right here before I end this tonight. But there's a lot of people that will say, well, Jesus was a great man. He was a great example. I remember the guy that made our first television set he had made these sets for Hollywood stars and stuff. And so anyway, he was working on our set and I was talking to him about the Lord. And I, I asked him about his standing with the Lord. And he says, well, I believe that Jesus was a great man. He was the greatest example of love that the world has ever seen. But he says, you know, there's many paths unto God and Jesus is just one path to God. And I said, that is absolutely wrong. And he says, why would you say that? And I said, because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Acts chapter 4, verse 12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men, whereby you must be saved. I said, Jesus claimed to be the only way. Now, he, he was either who he claimed to be and he was the only way to God or he was a crook. He was a liar. Or at the very best, he was deceived because he said, I'm the only way. And so you can't accept your idea and think that, well, Jesus is just a way. Allah, it's the same thing if you go through Muhammad or it's the same thing if you go through Buddha. No, Jesus is the only way. There is no salvation in anybody else. And it's not up to you to create your own God and to come up with your own thing. The Bible has been proven to be the Word of God. The Bible says that the Word of God is quick. That means alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. I know it's real because it's working on the inside of me. We've seen our sun raised from the dead. You're too late to tell me that the Word of God isn't God's Word and it's not inspired because it's already inspired me and changed my life. And I'm seeing things happen that couldn't have happened without God. I'm telling you, it's real. Amen. It's alive. And you have to accept the revelation. The Bible is accurate. And if you interpret it correctly, the Old Testament law doesn't contradict Jesus. It shows us what Jesus set us free from. 
It shows us what we really deserved and it makes me appreciate my salvation even more when I recognize how holy God is and how unholy I am. Man, that's awesome. And I tell you, God is a good God. He wants only good things for you. It's a lie of the devil. Satan has maligned God and sad to say religion has been one of the greatest tools that he's used to turn people against God. And in this nation, you know, there's been a lot of stuff done in the name of God and all of these religious stuff. And I guarantee you it's turned many, many, many people off to God. But true Christianity isn't a religion. It's a relationship with a person. And I tell you, He loves you. And if we would go out and catch on fire for God, the world to come watch you burn. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Welcome to a special edition of Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. Today, Andrew continues his teaching on who God is and who we are, recorded live from the 2019 Grace and Faith Conference in Telford, England. You need to recognize that you were an absolute mess before Jesus saved you. Apart from God's influence in your life, you just don't realize how perfect God created us to be. And now, here's Andrew. So last night, I started sharing about who God is. There's a lot of confusion, and man, there is so much that I could share on that that uh, I didn't by any means cover everything at all, but I just gave a brief introduction that God is a good God. God is not the source of your problems. And even in the Old Testament where you saw the wrath of God poured out on people, that was only temporary is what Galatians chapter 3 said, until the seed should come, talking about Jesus. And Jesus has set us free from the wrath of God. All of the wrath of God came upon Jesus and Jesus bore your punishment, your sickness, your disease, your poverty, and if you can receive the truth and believe, you can be free from everything that Satan is trying to do in your life. You do not have to settle for less than God's best. And so we were talking about the goodness of God last night. Tonight, I'm going to share some things that uh, may not bless some of you. But again, the truth will make you free. And I am going to be sharing about who we are without Christ. And this isn't only prior to salvation. This is also after salvation if you are trusting in yourself. And I tell you, this is not, uh, most people don't agree with this. And I know you guys are awesome. Appreciate you coming out to this conference. You're the cream of the crop. And so God bless you, but many of you do not believe what I'm going to be teaching tonight. And I can prove it by the way you live. I can prove it. And, and uh, so I hope this rubs you the wrong way. I hope that this goes against your selfishness and your self-esteem and your thinking that you are absolutely awesome. Because before you can fully appreciate what God has done, you've got to realize the mess that we were in. Look at this verse in Isaiah chapter 51, verse 1. It says, hearken to me. Ye that follow after righteousness. How many of you here are following after righteousness? One. <laughs> God bless you, Dwayne. Boy, we got our work cut out. Nobody else in here is following after righteousness. This is talking about all of us. Righteousness is just right standing with God. For the believer, it's already an accomplished work and we've got it. But I mean, this ought to be what... Uh, you know, floats our boat. This ought to be what it makes us excited is being in right standing with God. So ye that follow after righteousness, hearken unto me, ye that seek the Lord, look unto the rock from which ye are hewn and to the hole of the pit from which ye are digged. This means that we are supposed to look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, and see Him. And that's what I was talking about last night, who God is and that God is love. But you're also supposed to look to the hole of the pit from which you were digged. 
You know what? You need to recognize that you were an absolute mess before Jesus saved you. And some of you are thinking, well, I really wasn't that bad. You're in a big mess because you don't realize what happened. You know, over in Luke chapter 7, this is where the woman came and broke the uh, ointment and poured it on Jesus' feet and people criticized him. Judas criticized him and says, this should have been sold and given to the poor. And it goes on to say he didn't care about the poor. He was a thief and he wanted the money that was in the bag. Those who criticize people for receiving offerings and, and uh, giving and things like that, you got that Judas complex, the same spirit that was on Judas. You know how that wound up for him. But Jesus said, those that have been forgiven little will love little. Those who have been forgiven much will love much. And did you know in the eyes of the world, I lived a holier life than most people. You've heard me say this before, but I've never said a word of profanity, never taken a drink of liquor, never smoked a cigarette. I've never even tasted coffee. And some people think coffee. Well, the Bible says you can drink any deadly thing and it shall not harm you. So you got a scripture to stand on for drinking coffee. I'm just saying that I lived a super holy life, but who wants to be the best sinner that ever went to hell? But did you know what? I think I have a greater revelation of God's forgiveness for me than a lot of people do. Not everybody, but a lot of people. And one of the ways that I got that is I was born again when I was eight years old. But when I was 18, I was in a prayer meeting and I was very uh, self-righteous thinking I was better than everybody else. And I was concerned about what everybody was going to think about me. And I don't understand exactly how this happened, why it happened, but God showed up in that prayer meeting about 10 o'clock on a Saturday night and God showed up and I saw the glory of God and I saw his holiness and I saw the righteousness of God and compared to the perfection of God, all of my righteousness was like filthy rags. You know, that's what Isaiah said. And I believe it was Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 6, somewhere around there. And did you know that the word filthy rag there, it literally means a menstrual cloth. Your self-righteousness, your goodness is like a menstrual cloth. And I saw the glory of God. And in comparison, I was filthy and dirty, even though I lived better than a lot of other people. Compared to God, man, I was vile and I thought God was going to kill me. And for about an hour and a half, I turned myself inside out. And you got to remember, I hadn't done a lot of the things outwardly, but Jesus revealed that if you lust in your heart, you're guilty of adultery. If you've hated in your heart, you're guilty of murder. And I knew that. And so I just started confessing not only the things I had done, but I started confessing my thoughts my feelings, and I was naming names, <laughs> amen. I hated this person and I was naming names and whatever reputation I had, I blew it. I just, I did everything and I expected God to kill me and to my surprise, instead of punishment or rejection, I had a tangible love flow over me for four and a half months. I was caught up in the presence of God. And I've never gotten over it. And I never intend to get over it. But what I'm saying is, I may not have done some of the things other people have done, but I understand my relative unworthiness to God more than most people do. And I understand that I have been forgiven a lot. I was headed to hell and there isn't a hell number two or a hell number three. I was going to hell and I knew it. And because of that, that's what jump-started my relationship with God. And I really believe that that's one of the things that has kept me from ever being depressed, discouraged. And I, I get people that criticize me. I'm not saying that, that you're bad if you've been depressed, but I'm just saying that I saw God's love for me and his forgiveness. And I knew it had nothing to do with me. It wasn't my goodness. I didn't earn anything from God. I deserved to go to hell. 
And I saw that. And because of it, I just can't be depressed. I can't be discouraged. There's nothing that could happen to me that even remotely compares to the love and the forgiveness that God has given me. And because I'm focused on that, it just keeps me from going through the valleys and all of these things that so many preach that you have to do. And I'm saying this in love, but if you are up and down like a yo-yo and you're happy one minute and then depressed, it's because you don't really understand what God has done for you. Matter of fact, it says over in 2 Peter, he that does these things has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. And I tell you, there's a lot of Christians that do not understand what we've been forgiven of. So what I want to do tonight is to show you the mess that you were in before Jesus came into your life. We're going to look to the pit that you came out of. And it's worse than what you realize. And if you're one of those that think, well, I wasn't so bad. All I needed was just a little bit of help. My life was pretty good and Jesus was just the icing on the cake. I wonder if you truly got born again. You can't get born again without recognizing that you are a sinner and that you need help. The Word of God is what God has to say about us. Our society today says people are basically good. The Bible says people are basically bad. You at your core, before you were born again, were absolutely a child of the devil and by nature a child of the devil. I'm going to give you some scriptures that show you that. You were headed to hell. You were going to split hell wide open if Jesus hadn't have come and forgiven you. Here in Genesis chapter 6 and in verse 5, it says, And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination, notice every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. This was 1,656 years after the fall of Adam. In 1,600 years, the human race had gotten to where every thought of their heart was only evil continually. There's probably some people right here that think, well, that's not the way it is with me. And you know what? If you're born again and if God's been renewing you, well, then that's possible. But apart from God's influence in your life, you just don't realize how perfect God created us to be. We watch murder and adultery and lying and stealing. And I don't know what shows you have over here, and I don't really watch that much television in the U.S., but I've heard that they have uh, programs about the survivor and people, every one of them, they get into anger and hate and they yell at each other and they show these things about people dating and every time there's anger. And we use that stuff for entertainment. That's evil. God did not endorse any of that stuff. And we have just adopted evil that we don't even realize how bad it is. But God created us to live a lot bigger, a lot better than what most of us are. And whether you realize it or not, many of the thoughts of our heart are evil. And look at the next verse. It says in verse 6, And it repented the Lord that He had made man on the earth, and it grieved Him at His heart. I have never read that verse that I don't say, Father, forgive us. I'm so sorry. God created us to be a pleasure unto Him. Revelation chapter 4, verse 11, for His pleasure we are and were created. That means the original purpose and still God's purpose is so that He could love you and get pleasure out of you. God loves you the way that a parent loves a child and He wants to see you prosper and be in health. That's what it says in 3 John chapter 1, verse 2, Beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. It grieves the Lord when He sees you sick. It grieves the Lord when He sees you poor. It grieves God when He sees you depressed and discouraged and all of this stuff. And I guarantee you, this is a terrible scripture that God was so grieved with the way that His creation turned out, it repented Him that He even made man on the earth. But His great love for us, He sent His Son. But you've got to recognize that, man... God didn't look at you and think, oh, you are so awesome. I can't live without you. That's not the way it was. In Ezekiel chapter 16, 
The Lord talks about how it was when He chose Israel. He says it wasn't because you were the most beautiful. It wasn't because you were the brightest. He compared it to walking by and seeing a baby that had been born wallowing in its own blood with its navel uncut, wallowing in the filth, in the dirt, and it was caked up. And he says, that's the way I found you. And I took you and I cleaned you up and I did all of these things for you. God didn't choose us because we were so awesome. God chose us because he is awesome. God is love. You are not lovely. And again, some of you... I I resent that. You resemble that. (laughs) I'm talking about you without God. I'm talking about who you are in just yourself. We are all fallen from what God intended us to be. And God didn't choose us because we are lovely, but because He is love. In Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, the heart is evil above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? That's what the Bible says about us on our own. Our heart is evil. It's wicked. This isn't talking about just the rapist and the murderers. This is talking about every single person. Because of fear, it says in uh, Psalms chapter 36 verse 1, The transgression of the wicked says that there is no fear of God before his eyes. The way people are living says that they don't honor God. They don't respect God. And in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 6, it says, By mercy and truth is iniquity purged, and by the fear of God, men depart from evil. The fear of God can cause a diminishing or a controlling of some of these things. We may not act it out, but I can guarantee you left to yourself, your heart before Christ is evil and desperately wicked. And that is descriptive of every person that has lived upon this planet. There are some people that think, oh no, people are basically good. And if we just gave them enough money and if we were to take them out of a poverty situation, everybody will be nice to each other. That's not true. I'm going to share some things with you tonight that you've never heard a sermon on before. I can guarantee it. And uh, I'll show you what your heart is capable of. Look at this over in Ephesians chapter 2. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. And in Ephesians chapter 2... He says in verse 1, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. You were dead in trespasses and sins. You weren't on life support. You weren't just sick. You were dead. Dead. In verse 2 it says, Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Before you got born again, you had a demonic spirit working in you. You may not have been what the Bible calls possessed, but you were influenced, you were controlled by the devil. Self-interest, self-love, self-promotion is demonic. Thank you for that thunderous silence. I'm saying things that people don't like. And they think, well, I've got to take care of myself. I've got to promote myself. If I don't promote me, who will? God, if you would trust him, you exalting yourself and promoting yourself is not a godly trait. And yet there's most people in here. You just can't take it if somebody says something about you. You've got to defend yourself and set the record straight. The Bible says, vengeance is mine, thus saith the Lord, I will repay. When you defend yourself, you exempt yourself from God defending you. Man, there's a million applications I could make to this. How many times have you had your mate say something about you and you get in and defend yourself? Did you know as long as you are defending yourself, God won't. But when you shut up, and just turn it over to the Lord and throw it over on the Lord. God will deal with your mate. God can get to your mate. But as long as you are saying all of these things and rebuking them, God can't get a word in edgewise. And if he was to speak to them, they would think, well, that's my wife that said this. They wouldn't recognize it as being God. 
Man, I got a great example of that, but in the name of Jesus, I'm not going to give it. I got to move on, but man, that is awesome stuff. Just real quickly. Most people believe that when Mary, you know, was told by the angel that she would be pregnant and give birth to the Messiah, that she immediately went and told Joseph about it. There's even songs written about that. But let me just ask you, how in the world are you going to tell your fiance that, look, I'm pregnant, but honest. I haven't been unfaithful. It's the Holy Spirit that gave me. I don't think there was any way to do it. And according to scripture in Luke, when the Lord appeared unto Mary, it says she went immediately into the hill country to visit Elizabeth and found out that Elizabeth was six months pregnant. Angel told her that. Gabriel told her that. And she was with Elizabeth for three months until Elizabeth gave birth to John. And then she came back and you have to put uh, Luke's account and Matthew's account together. And in Matthew, it says that she was found with child by the Holy Spirit. I don't believe that she told Joseph. What happened? Because how do you explain? I'm the only virgin in the world that is ever going to have a child. I believe she didn't say anything. She literally trusted God and did not promote herself. And Joseph found her with child. And then the angel of the Lord appeared unto Joseph in a dream and told him that what had happened to Mary was of the Lord and even gave the name of Jesus. And because Mary hadn't told him, then he knew that, man, this had to be God. But if Mary would have been telling him all of this stuff and he had had a dream, he probably would have thought, Mary planted those thoughts in my head. I dreamed this because Mary said it. And the fact that the angel told him the same name that he told Mary, what a confirmation it was to them. But I'm telling you, most of us won't let the Holy Spirit say anything that we haven't already said. That's a big problem. Selfishness, self-promotion, self-defense. He says, vengeance is mine, thus saith the Lord. He will repay. But we've been walking according to the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. And in verse 3, this is Ephesians 2, 3, among whom we also all had our conversation. This is saying that this is for every person in here. We all had our conversation in time past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of of the flesh and of the mind. Did you know when you just fulfill your lust, this is not the way that God created us to be. And I say this in love, but some of you aren't going to like this, but you know, it's like when you pet a cat against the grain and all their hair stands up. The way you solve that is not to quit petting. You just turn the cat around and you keep petting. <laughs> And if what I say rubs you the wrong way, repent, turn around, and it'll go to feeling good. Welcome to a special edition of Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. Today, Andrew continues his teaching on who God is and who we are. Recorded live from the 2019 Grace and Faith Conference in Telford, England. You need to recognize that you were an absolute mess before Jesus saved you. Apart from God's influence in your life, you just don't realize how perfect God created us to be. And now, here's Andrew. I say this in love, but some of you aren't going to like this, but... You know, it's like when you pet a cat against the grain and all their hair stands up. The way you solve that is not to quit petting. You just turn the cat around and you keep petting. And if what I say rubs you the wrong way, repent, turn around, and it'll go to feeling good. But did you know if you're real overweight, you know what? You have indulged your flesh. You are satisfying your lust. That is not a godly trait. We accept it as being, well, this is just normal. It's my genes. No, it's not. It's not your genes. It's what's in your genes. <laughs> it's you. 
and you have fulfilled the lust of the flesh. The only way you get fat is to eat more than you need more often than you need it. Anybody miss that? <laughs> fulfilling the desires of the flesh. You were by nature a child of wrath, even as others. We've accepted this. People today just accept that, you know what, I'm just, I'm an addict here. I've, I've got this addiction. I'm a drug addict. I'm an alcoholic. And we blame it on our genes and stuff like that. The Bible says that you have control over you. Your life is going the way you think. It is not because of your genes. It's not because of some deficiency in your genetic makeup. It's because you have not resisted the devil. And that's the reason that Satan is running roughshod over you. Thank you for that thunderous silence. And people don't like what I'm saying because <laughs> you're saying there's something wrong with me. That's exactly what I'm saying, amen. <laughs> I'm saying that we at our core are an absolute mess. And it's only when you quit trusting in yourself and you go to trusting in God that you are going to find freedom. And one of the worst things that's happened is our society has increased and we've now got medicine and we've now got uh, psychiatrists and we've got all of these coping mechanisms that allow you to survive, not to thrive. You'll never be the person God wants you to be, but you can cope. You can limp through life on social security or whatever you call it over here, welfare. You, you'll have enough money that you can survive, but you don't have to deal with the root of the problem. And so you just allow things to fester. I'm telling you, it's not all of these other things. It's not what other people do to you that's the problem. Your biggest problem is you. You are absolutely your worst enemy, your flesh. If I can talk fast enough, I'm going to get to some other scriptures on this. In Psalms chapter 51, verse 5, David said, In sin did my mother conceive me. This isn't saying that he was conceived in an adulterous relationship, but it says that all of us, just like Ephesians chapter 2, you were by nature a child of wrath. Every person was born a sinner. If I had time, I could turn to Romans chapter 5, verses 15 on through the end of the chapter, and five different times it says you became a sinner through what Adam did, not through what you do. Your sins did not make you a sinner. Your sins did not cause you to need salvation. You were born a sinner and it was that sin nature that made you sin. Boy, most people don't understand that. And so if you've lived a relatively holy life, well, then you feel better about yourself. But if you have really messed up big time, some people just can't cope with that. It's because you think, that your sins are what caused you to be separated from God. No, it was your sin nature. Again, I wish I had time to do that, but Romans chapter 5, go study it out, verses 15 through the end of the chapter, and five different times, by one man's offense, many were made sinners. You were made a sinner through what Adam did. You were born a sinner, and the reason you sin is because that is your nature to sin prior to getting born again. It was your nature. You know, I'm always amazed that I go over to these people's house and they have a dog. And there was this one friend of mine that every time their little dog, every time I came over, it'd get so excited, it'd just wet all over the floor. And they'd, oh, I'm so sorry. And they'd just apologize. And this other friend, I was over there, dog would stick their nose in places that nobody nose should be going. And they'd say, oh, I'm sorry. And they'd spank it, you know, and tell, quit doing that. And I always respond and say, it's the dog in them. <laughs> Did you know you can paint their toenails? You can shampoo them. You can put a bow in their hair, but they're a dog. They are not a child. And you can teach it to go to a certain place and use the bathroom over there. But you know what? If it's a dog and if you left it alone and if you didn't punish it and restrict it, it will act like a dog because that's its nature. I know some of you are really offended because your dog is a member of the family. I'm telling you, your dog is a dog. 
It's a dog. It's not a person. It's a dog. And its nature is a dog nature. And you can paint you up and you can paint your toenails and fingernails and you can get your hair done and you can put on makeup and do whatever you want to. But you know what? Without Christ, you are a sinner by nature and left to yourself, you will sin. I hadn't got time to go through all of this, but this is the reason that even though we are now under grace and that we are a new creature, we still need laws because not everybody's born again. And even a lot of born again people are not letting their spirit man rule. And we need laws. We need restrictions. The fear of God causes people to depart from evil. We need that. And so anyway, I'll talk more about that. Mark chapter 10, verse 18. And Jesus said unto them, Why callest thou me uh, good? There is none good but one, that is God. Jesus was talking to the rich young ruler who was, he ran and fell at his feet and he said, good master, what must I do? And Jesus said, why are you calling me good? I'm either God or quit calling me good. Did you know down there in the 20th verse, he dropped the good and he just said, master. He wasn't willing to make Jesus God. And Jesus said himself, that there is none good but God. Romans chapter 3 verse 10 talks about all of us have sinned. There is none righteous, no, not one. We are all together undone. We have all committed things. You cannot claim goodness on your own. And I, again, know that I am going against tradition and against our society because some people, I'm really a good person at my core. No, you are really a sinner. You are an evil person at your core unless you've been born again. The only way you can feel good about yourself is to compare yourselves among yourselves. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 12 says, But they comparing themselves among themselves and measuring themselves by themselves are not wise. This is what the Pharisee did. The Pharisee was in prayer and he saw the publican over there, a tax collector, a person who was a traitor to the Jews and a cheat and stealing money. And he says, Father, I thank you that I'm not like other men. I thank you that I fast twice in the week. I pay tithes of mint and anise and cumin. I thank you that I am not like this publican over there. Jesus said, but the publican, he couldn't even lift his eyes up. He said, oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus said, this man, the publican, was justified in the sight of God, not the religious people. Did you know the only people that Jesus ever rebuked were the scribes and the Pharisees and the hypocrites? You can read it in uh, Matthew chapter 23. He says, you whited sepulchers, you're full of dead man's bones. You look good on the outside, but inside you're full of corruption. The only people Jesus ever rebuked were the religious, self-righteous people. He didn't rebuke the prostitutes. He didn't rebuke the people that were on the you know, the bottom of the rung of the ladder, the publicans. He, he, the only people he rebuked were people who were proclaiming their own goodness. If you were a person saying, but I'm really a good person and I resent what you're saying, Jesus would rebuke you for your self-righteousness. There's a lot of people that say, Jesus, I don't need all of you. I just need a little bit. I'm not like everybody else. If you'll just make up my deficit, I'm really pretty good. Man, that... That's terrible. That's terrible. You need to recognize that without Jesus, you are nothing. And so many other things. Um, I'm going to skip through some of these real quickly. Let's turn over to 1 Corinthians 4, 7. For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? You know, here's one of the benefits of understanding the whole of the pit that you came out of and that you were by nature a sinner is because when you understand that any good thing that is in you came from God, it is not you, it is not your nature, then it'll be like this scripture says, any good thing in you, you received it from God. It came through your relationship with God. And if you received it, then why would you boast as if it was something you did? 
You know, if you've got a talent or an ability, if you can sing, if you can dance, if you can draw, if you are a, an accountant, if you can work with numbers, whatever it is that you've got, God gave it to you. You did not come up with it on your own. And some of you disagree and say, oh, no, I've worked hard. I went to school. All you did was develop what God put there. You can't put in what God left out. It's God that gave you your health. It's God that gave you whatever talents that you've got. But a self-made man or woman will sit there and take pride and say, look what I have done. And yet this scripture says, you don't have a single thing that God didn't give you. And if God gave it to you, then why are you boasting as if somehow or another you did it? Amen or oh me. I know some of you don't like that. You got all your awards on your a mantle and you look at them and just feel like I am awesome. <laughs> if there is any awesomeness in you, it's because God put it there, not because you deserve it. <laughs> Proverbs chapter three, verse five, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding in all of your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. We are commanded not to trust in ourselves, but to trust in God. Proverbs chapter 14, 12 and 16, 25, it says it twice. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Notice it says the end, there's only one end, singular, are the ways of death. There's many different paths, but they all end up in one place and that's death. If you are trusting in yourself, if you think you are absolutely awesome, if you think that God, no wonder you chose me. What a great choice. Yeah, I can see the wisdom of why you chose me. I am absolutely awesome. That's going to end in death. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, this is the reason so many people are failing is because they are trusting in themselves and thinking, God, I don't need you. You know, one of the benefits of the way God worked in my life, this first encounter that I really had with the Lord, He just showed me I was a zero with the rim knocked off. Did you know that one of the benefits of that is that, man, it is easy for me to trust in God because I know that in me I don't have any ability whatsoever. You know, here I am speaking in front of, I don't know, at least 2,500 people, 3,000 people. I used to be so introverted I couldn't look at a person in the face and talk to them. When I was 18 years old, I had a man walk by on the street and say, good morning. And I was two blocks down the street sitting in my car. And finally, I said, good morning. <laughs> I was painfully shy. And I know that God speaks through me. Some of you may doubt that. Some of you may think that this is all me. But I'm telling you what, I've got a gift and it's from God. It's not from me. There was a time that I was out jogging and I was going six miles a day and I didn't realize it when I went down into low altitude and it was over 100 degrees that I had to cut back and I had been fasting for three days and so I went jogging my normal pace and ran and I just did something to me and I, I stood in a pulpit on Sunday morning and I had to literally hold on to the pulpit because I couldn't see the front row. Everything was spinning I did something to me and I, I couldn't put two words together. And I got up to preach and it just flowed out of me. It was so awesome, I went and bought the tape. <laughs> and I listened to it and it was one of the best messages I ever gave and I couldn't put two words together. It wasn't me talking. It was the Holy Spirit. And so it's easy for me to give God the credit for any good thing that's happening because whatever I can do, standing in front of people, this is not me. It is not normal. It's a healthy place to be. And then when the devil comes to you and says, you didn't do very good, you sorry thing, instead of me trying to justify myself, I can just agree with him. Well, I never was any good in the first place, amen. If I didn't do any good, it must have been because I wasn't relying upon God. I must have been trusting in myself. The devil, you know, if, if you're dead to yourself, the devil can't do anything to you. If you had a corpse here in front of us, you could spit on the corpse, you could kick the corpse, you could insult the corpse. And if it's a corpse, it isn't going to respond. 
You know why you respond when people criticize you and something doesn't go right? Because you're so alive to yourself and you think so highly of yourself. It bothers you when you mess up. It doesn't bother me. It, it doesn't surprise me when I mess up. Amen. Now, that I'm not, I don't use the grace of God to encourage that. I'm always trying to follow the Lord and do better. But I'm saying that if I mess up, it does not surprise me. Matter of fact, it would surprise me if I didn't mess up. When we moved into one of our buildings, everybody was just praising God. And like I told you, I have to tell people when I'm excited because I'm always the same. And I had a woman come up to me and she says, you don't act excited. Are you discouraged because we got in here three months later than what you wanted? And I told this woman, I said, look, I've never done anything perfectly in my life. We got in here debt free, $3.2 million. I said, man, I'm thrilled. But see, some people, well, it didn't work out exactly the way I wanted. Well, man, that's just because God's got to use me. In Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 23, it says, Oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walks to direct.